So it must have been last August that the integral stage, uh, Bruce Alderman hosted a debate between myself and David Long, and I felt like I got my view across reasonably well. I don't think the debate could be called a success necessarily because neither one of us uh, left feeling any different than we arrived. I mean, I felt, I think, frustrated, which was not what I went into the debate with, though there were indications that it might turn out to be a frustrating exchange. Um, but in any event, it felt like uh, David and I weren't going to move the ball forward in any important way, so I kind of disengaged. And then um, I kept hearing from people that watched the debate um, and found it valuable for whatever reason in laying out these two positions that one might take. Uh, and in the broadest sense, I mean, these two views are sort of like, you know, the, the uh, two cultures that C.P. Snow talked about, or uh, this sort of bifurcation, as Whitehead put it, uh, between science and the humanities, or be between um, nature, as it is known by the sciences, and um, culture, as it is experienced, you know, by people. And... Um, you know, as modern rational people, uh, enlightened in the Western sense of the term, we're, we're supposed to keep these things apart and strive to purify our knowledge of nature from our practice uh, of culture. Because when we let the two mix, all sorts of bad things happen. Um, falsehoods and myths propagate, right? when we don't purify our understanding of nature from our belief systems and our social practices. That would be the sort of scientific rationalist's worry. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, a sort of modern fundamentalist religious believer is going to want to say that um, our the soul's concern with God is sort of... Um, entirely isolable from uh, science's concerns about nature. So whatever science turns out to tell us, um, whatever the scientific inquiry reveals to be true of nature, it sort of doesn't matter for religion because our religious beliefs are based merely upon our soul's experience of God, as revealed in the Bible, as revealed through church liturgy and, and dogma, and dogma is a word I want to flag. We need to talk about that, Laura David. Um, and so the I think in the modern period, there's a bifurcation, a, a split, a dualism between um, nature and culture, or between mind and matter, between science and religion. And um, everyone's trying to figure out <laughs> how to survive this... Um, unsustainable situation. I mean, it's an impossible situation that the modern person, that modern peoples have put themselves in, this attempt to purify nature from culture. The more we try to do so, as, you know, sociologists and um, philosophers like Bruno Latour pointed out, the more we try to purify one from the other, the more we end up entangling them ever more inextricably from one another. And for Latour, he, he speaks in terms of hybrids, um, and Latour has been attacked by the scientific materialists and the rationalists as a social constructionist, but I think Latour is actually more of a realist than the materialists in the sense that he's affirming objectivity in a very strong sense, but he's saying that science's relationship to objects is always mediated it's always a relationship, in other words. The scientist is not a neutral witness, a passive observer. The scientist has no God's eye view of objects that are mind independent in some ontological sense. Science is a social activity. It's a practice that living embodied human beings embedded in their cultures, it's that they engage in, right? It's a human activity. 
And so for Latour to talk about an objective fact is to talk about a well-run laboratory uh, staffed by highly credentialed and widely acknowledged uh, and recognized experts in their field. And they're constantly being peer reviewed, right? And they have a budget that allows them, that affords them the best equipment. Um, you know, some scientists like get to work at the uh, Large Hadron Collider that's billions and billions of dollars, decades of work. Um, and they get to, you know, collide matter energy at uh, close to the speed of light in this giant machine and take measurements at a scale and interpret that data from the measuring instruments in the collider through a network of supercomputers spread across continents and make sense of all that data. It's a truly monumental feat. I mean, I'm able to sit up here um, you know, at the edge of a, of a canyon in Northern California and record a video on a device that will um, soon send copies of it to anyone on Earth who wants to par partake. <laughs> um, truly amazing. And so, you know, Latour, um, other thinkers who I think with, Whitehead, Schelling, none of them are saying that science is a fairy tale. On the contrary, science is the most powerful force uh, of channeling will that humans have yet devised, um, or yet evolved, if you prefer. So science needs to be understood in the evolutionary context which gave rise to human beings capable of doing science. Uh, in other words, science's picture of nature needs to be a picture of a, of a, of a cosmos capable of consciousness. And the way that... Um, see, I, I want to distinguish between what we might call physics in some ideal abstract sense as knowledge of nature, the way nature is. And there is a physics that, that, that the scientific community has arrived at. It involves, you know, of course, relativity and quantum theory and increasingly information theory, uh, thermodynamics, and these different sort of angles of approach upon nature, uh, describing and providing um, formal formal mathematical descriptions of, um, you know, algebraic and geometrical descriptions of the way that nature is. And we need to pay very close attention to that. But the reason there's still something left over um, after even our best, most up-to-date physical understanding, the reason there's metaphysics, it's not because we're adding anything to the physics that the scientists are describing. It's because that physics, those equations, still need interpretation in the context of what we cannot help but take for granted, which is our own conscious existence, um, our experience uh, here and now together, because we're not just here and now as monads, we're here and now together, right? Whether with other humans or, um, you know, even if right now in this particular place and moment of my life, I'm alone, I'm recording myself, and also historically, who I have come to be in this moment is fully a result of um, enculturation and, uh, you know, adults who cared for me for years while I was helpless. And so I'm fully socialized even when I'm on an island or at the edge of a cliff or something, you know, by myself. I mean, we're never by ourselves, but even outside the context of humanity, uh, I exist in an atmosphere of gaseous molecules. The composition of that atmosphere is... Um, finely tuned. It's very precise so as to allow um, the plants and the clouds uh, and all the other animals to coexist. So my presence here and now is together with the rest of the biosphere and, and ultimately um, the universe. I mean, the parents of life on Earth are the sun and the moon. And David might worry that that is some kind of a nice sounding story and a myth and can't be taken literally. But no, I mean it scientifically. The sun, we are in the sun. We are the earth, uh, all the planets are part of the sun within the sun's atmosphere. So we are solar activities. And of course, we're, we're differentiated relatively from the sun as a different kind of matter. Um, the earth has its own electromagnetic field. Not all planets do. And that field affords a certain um, membrane uh, that protects us 
us, meaning the living biotic community of life on the surface. And, um, but still, we are a product of the sun. We exist only by virtue of its energetic generosity. And similarly, the rhythms of the moon, its tidal interaction, it, its tidal impact, you know, pulling on either side of the earth as it uh, revolves around us to shift the water, the oceans. Um, this is part of what churned prebiotic chemistry into, you know, um, self-producing and reproducing life was this rhythm of the moon and the tides. Um, and so I mean it quite scientifically and literally that the sun and the moon are the parents of life on earth. Um, and so there's a way that we, we, we use story and myth even to make sense of, of the best science. Um, we have to. And so here's my, my message for David. Um, sorry it took me 11 minutes to get to it. He seems to be criticizing Bernardo Kastrup and Deepak Chopra, who, who I disagree with. I'm not an idealist. David, David and I have been over this. He thinks I am an idealist, but uh, I think it might be instructive for David to look at what I disagree with Kastrup about, which, I don't know, I think back in 2015 or thereabouts was the first time that Bernardo Kastrup and I exchanged several blog posts um, getting into it with each other on questions of ontology and metaphysics. Um, David might be interested to see why I disagree with Castro, but I, the way, the whole approach, let's talk about the medium here instead of the message, because the medium is very important in this case. David's doing a debunking video, and there's no room at all in his very approach and attitude for any sort of charitable reading of what Kastrup is doing. And so he's not even understanding what Kastrup is doing. Um, but he's going on the attack from the very beginning, accusing Kastrup of doing all these sorts of things that he, in the very act, is himself performing. And so it's almost a performative self-contradiction. I mean, it you know, he calls Bernardo Kastrup a con man. He's just selling a product, an attitude that makes people feel good and has no relationship to science or philosophy or truth. And then immediately after that, David's video ends and he says, buy some merch from his store. And I just feel like, come on, man. I mean, not that we shouldn't be able to make a living. And I mean, but the thing is you're accusing Kastrup of doing what you yourself are doing. And at least so far, he seems to be doing it better than you. I mean, and here's the other part. You haven't read any of his work. It doesn't seem to me. You're, you're nitpicking on one particular video that he made six years ago or whatever. This man has dozens of books. He's um, made quite a contribution to the conversation, more than just in the form of YouTube videos. And I know that David has a whole argument about how important it is to engage in this digital environment, and I do engage, and I will continue to, but it's also, I think, incumbent upon David to accept that the conversation is going on in universities and in laboratories and at conferences, and to talk about something like emergence, which is one of David's favorite concepts, as if it's scientific and as if there's some authoritative consensus. I've never actually heard David go into the specifics of how emergence works. He just gestures towards the authority of science with a capital S about how we now know that mind emerges from, from matter, or however you want to phrase it, that, that consciousness is just brain activity. We now know because of emergence. David and I debated about this. I'd love to hear an explanation of what you mean by emergence and how it gets out of some of the problems I've raised about it. I'm not going to repeat that here because I've already done it ad nauseum back in August. Um, but the problem here is that uh, emergence is a profoundly uh, multi and even transdisciplinary problem. And that's why there is really no consensus about how it works among scientists. So when we look at sciences with a lowercase s and see how, you know, to understand the emergence of something like consciousness from the brain, we not only need neuroscience, 
um, and philosophy, we need physics and chemistry and biology. Um, and so, in other words, we need to coordinate the expertise of multiple disciplines. And each discipline itself has multiple sub-disciplines. You know, within biology, you have the molecular biologists, and you have the evolutionary developmental biologists, and the, um, you know, the zoologists, and the ethologists, and, uh, you know, the you know, cell biologists and people who are working on very different problems, uh, immunologists, right, doctors. And so to really get at what life is, just life, before we even talk about how consciousness might emerge from it or what its relationship to matter might be, like you all already have to coordinate all these ex experts. And so I guess I, w I just think it's really important to remember that science is not a monolith. When we start to say that science is just a authoritative knowledge we run the risk of these um, abstract arguments about emergence so again david get into the specifics on that i'd love to hear more about that from you even send me a paper about it that i you know in a journal that i can and i can read it and, and see what you want to mean when you say that emergence is the explanation for consciousness uh, the vikings are invading or Somebody has a conch. Um, well, I guess that's my my signal to uh, call it quits here. Um, I think, you know, I'm always open for further dialogue with David. So, David, if, if you want to do a uh, back and forth on what's going on here, I can explain why I'm not an idealist, where I disagree with Castrop, why I think it's unfair of you to call him a con man when you're playing the same game. Um, and then, you know, of course, I would want to say that it's not that we're all con men, it's that uh, this is how languaging creatures engage with one another in this type of media environment. Yeah, of course, we're selling something, right? We're trying to make sense and we want to be heard. Um, and so we're trying to appeal to our audience. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but... Uh, you shouldn't be acting in bad faith by accusing others of it, pretending like you're pure. So that's it. Enjoy your weekend, everyone.